Let's take a look at how to conduct a hypothesis test for proportions. Um, if you watch some of my other videos, you know that uh, we're going to follow a pattern called phantoms. Um, that's just an acronym for the steps that we take. So if you don't know what that is, you need some more information, you can go to some of my other videos uh, about hypothesis testing. But here's our example. Zogby International claims that 45% of people in the United States support making cigarettes illegal within the next five to 10 years. You decide to test the claim and ask a random sample of 200 people in the United States whether they support making cigarettes illegal within the next five to 10 years. Of the 200 people, 49% support this law. At alpha equals 0.05, is there enough evidence to support the claim? Well, as I go through phantoms, the first thing I'm going to, <clears throat> to write down is P. And P stands for your parameter statement. Now, this is a statement about the claim. So I want to write this. I will test the claim that 45% of people in the U.S. support making cigarettes illegal. Okay. Now, the reason we write this right at the beginning is because we want to know what we're trying to test. We want to know the claim that we are testing. And then at the very end, the last step will basically be this exact same sentence, but we will say whether our evidence supports this claim or it does not support this claim. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the next thing we need to do is write our null and alternative hypotheses. That's H for hypotheses. Well, the statement that I need to focus on is this one right here at the beginning. It says, uh, they claim that 45% of the people in the United States support making uh, cigarettes illegal. So they don't say more than 45%. They don't say less than 45%. They don't say um, <clears throat> at least or at most. They say 45% exactly. So that means that we are going to write our null hypothesis to say that the proportion of people that support this is... 45% or equal to 0.45 and that is our claim. Well that means that the alternative hypothesis has to be not equal to 0.45. And notice that I'm putting P here because I'm talking about the proportion of people. The population proportion is represented by the letter P. <clears throat> the next thing we need to do is A which is check our assumptions and conditions. And I'm going to go to a different slide here. There are three assumptions and conditions that we need to check with um, for a hypothesis test for proportions. The first one is the randomization condition. We want to make sure that our sample was collected at random so that it represents the population. So if I go back, it tells me that I collect a random sample right here. So, whoops, let me undo that. I'm collecting a random sample. Why is it changing on me? <clears throat> right there. So I'm going to go ahead and take care of that condition. So the random randomization condition I can check off because the sample was randomly collected. There's two other conditions that I need to check. The next one is called the 10% condition. And that says that the sample size must be less than 10% of the entire population. <clears throat> I've got to be careful to make sure that my sample size isn't too large. And I want to make sure that my sample size is less than 10% of my population. And since my population is just United States citizens, the 10% condition is satisfied. 10% condition is satisfied by me saying my sample size was 200. 200 is less than 10% of all U.S. adults. Okay, 
And then finally, I want to look at something called the success failure condition. Even though we don't want our, our, our sample size to be too large, we need to make sure that we have at least 10 successes and 10 failures. Okay, we must have at least 10 successes and 10 failures. So what we're going to do is we're going to check N times P, our sample size times P, and our sample size times Q, and make sure that both of those are greater than 10. So here we go. P, by the way, is 0.45 from our null hypothesis. So to check our success failure condition, I ch take 200 times 0.45. And 200 times 0.45 is 90. So that's definitely, <clears throat> excuse me, greater than 10. And then I also want to check 200 times 0.55, which is going to be 110. And 110 is definitely greater than 10. So since both of these are okay, I should put an equal sign here, since both of these are okay, my success failure condition has been satisfied. All right, now that all that is satisfied, I can move on to N in phantoms, and that's name the test. Name the test. In this case, since I'm dealing with proportions, this is a two-tailed Z test with <clears throat> alpha equal to point oh five. Alpha was given to me in the original problem. I know it's a two-tailed test because the null hypothesis says equal to. If the symbol was greater than or equal to, it would be a left-tailed test. If the symbol in the null hypothesis was less than or equal to, it would be a right-tailed test. But because it says equal to, it is a two-tailed test. And I'm going to, it's a Z test because I'm dealing with proportions. And with proportions, I always want to use a Z distribution or a normal distribution. All right, let's keep moving and go to T, which is find the test statistic. Well, there's a formula to find this test statistic for proportions. Whoops. And it is right here. I'm going to drag it down. I've already typed it in. But I'm going to drag it down here. This is my test statistic. And I'm going to use the test statistic to find a the probability of this happening, which means um, I'm going to find the probability that it is... Uh, what is the probability that I'll have a sample that gives me less than 49%? <clears throat> so here we go. Here's my test statistic. My sample gave me a p hat or a sample proportion of 0.49. That's in the original problem right here. If I continue with the formula, p comes from my null and alternative hypothesis, which is 0.45, and I divide that by the standard deviation of my sampling distribution, which is 0.45 times 0.55 all over the square or over the, my sample size. I take the square root of all of that, which was 200. When I do the math, I've done the math ahead of time, I get a test statistic of 1.14. Well, how do I use this test statistic? What's it good for? Well, the test statistic allows me to find the area under the curve, which is called my p-value. In phantoms, O comes next, and that stands for obtain the p-value. <clears throat> and since this is a two-tailed test, what I do is this. I label 1.14 on my normal model, and I also label negative 1.14 on my normal model. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the area of this shaded region. And since it's a two-tailed test, I have to find the area of both of these tails. Well, I'm just going to find the area of this one tail, and then I'm just going to double it. Since it's symmetric and bell-shaped, I'm just going to double it. So here's how I obtain my p-value. My p-value, since it's a two-tailed test, is 2 times the area that's right here. And the way I find that area is on my calculator. I say normal CDF 
from 1.14, let me scoot all this over, 1.14 to 99. And again, the reason why I multiply it by 2 is because this is a two-tailed test. If this was a left-tailed test or a right-tailed test, then I would just find the area in that one tail, and I wouldn't have to multiply by 2. But let's go ahead and grab our calculators and find that value. Let's go 2 times normal CDF from 1.14 to 99 and I get a p-value that is equal to 0.254 about 0.254 so now I compare that to my alpha M stands for make a decision and I'm making a decision about the null hypothesis. There's two things that I need to decide. I am going to compare my p-value to alpha. And if the p-value is less than or equal to alpha, let me put this in here, then... I reject the null hypothesis. In turn, if the p-value is more than alpha, then I fail to reject the null hypothesis. <clears throat> All right, so let's compare the two. Well, my alpha is equal to 0 0.05. My p-value is 2.5, or I'm sorry, 0 0.254. 0 0.254. So my p-value is greater than or more than alpha. So I would say something like this. And it's important to write this sentence down. Since my p-value is more than alpha, I fail to reject the null hypothesis. And then finally I get to S, which stands for state your conclusion, and the conclusion I'm always talking about the claim. What can I say about the claim? Well, I am not going to reject. I fail to reject the null. So let's go back up to my null hypothesis. Since I am not rejecting the null hypothesis, that means that my evidence will support the claim. The claim is the null is in the null hypothesis. Therefore, if I am not rejecting the null, that means my evidence supports the claim. So here we go. I'm going to just type this one in. It takes a little bit less time. Here we go. There is enough evidence to support the claim that 45% of U.S. Americans support... Let's go back up to my thing. I forget what my claim was. I will test the claim that 45% of the people in the United States support making cigarettes illegal. So here we go. Support making cigarettes illegal. Now, you see what I did there at the very end? I didn't remember exactly what the claim was. I got so caught up in the math that I forgot what the claim was. Well, it helps me. Part of the reason that at the very beginning we write down the claim that we're going to test is so that at the very end we basically make the same statement 
only we tell whether or not we found enough evidence to support it or we did not find enough evidence to support it. So right there was an example of why it's important to write down the claim at the very beginning so that at the very end you can just refer to back to it and make your final conclusions. I hope this helps and have fun in your stats class.